Hi, this is Chandra Pulamar Seti from Pyramid Valley International and Buddha Siva Quantum Foundation. Today, I'm very happy to talk about the concept that thoughts and feelings create our outer reality. This is one of the most powerful spiritual science concepts, which is empowering each and every individual that our thoughts and feelings create reality, that our mind is always presiding over the matter, that our observation is creating our outer reality. In the entire history of time, many leaders of the past and present, many scientists, many spiritual masters have always said this, always echoed it. When I learned this principle in the year 2002 from Brahmashi Patrizi, that your thoughts are always creating your outer reality, it was tough to believe. But then I started experimenting with myself I'm a computer scientist by profession. I've been a successful business leader in the information technology industry. Having practiced meditation for the last 20 years and then experimenting on this fundamental principle that our thoughts and feelings always is, are creating an outer reality. And then utilizing these principles very effectively in having a great business outcome in a company acquisition on my own company. Then I can fundamentally say that this is the most empowering truth that we all can take. And when we combine this with meditation, we can make it very, very highly effective. We can make it become true into our own lives in manifesting and whatever wish that whatever that we wish to have. Let's understand and see what some of the great leaders of all times have talked about this. Mahatma Gandhiji has said a man is but a product of his thoughts, what he thinks he becomes. Albert Einstein, that we all know is a great quantum physicist Imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world, stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution. He always talked about dreaming. Albert Einstein always talked about dreaming. He was one of the all-time great mind explorer because he realized everything that you can think and you can, the more you can think in the mind, the more you can see it. That's how this whole quantum physics theory of relativity, many things were born from Einstein. Henry Ford said that if you think you can do a thing or think you cannot do a thing, you are still right. Whether you think you can do or whether you think you can't do, you're still right because what you think is what you become. That's Henry Ford, one of the all time very successful industrialist. James Allen, the English philosopher I mentioned, as a man thinks, so he is. And as he continues to th think, so he remains. As a man thinks, so he is. And as he continues to think, so he remains. That's James Allen. Napoleon Hill said this, whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. Napoleon Hill, whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. Walt Disney, most recently, one of the most creative geniuses in the world. He said, if you can dream it, you can do it. If you can dream it, you can do it. The famous business quote by many leaders who quote, if you can see it, you can hold it. If you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hand. Everything is always pointing to our thoughts, dear friends. Let's look at some more. Norman Vincent Pearl, 
said that change your thoughts and you change your world. Change your thoughts and you change your world. That's Norman Vincent Pearl. Gautama Buddha, whatever you dwell upon, you become. Whatever you dwell upon is what you become. That's precisely pointing back to our mind and thoughts. Jesus Christ, I said, we always have heard this, as you sow, so you reap. It is done unto you as you believe. What you believe is what will be done unto you. As you sow, so you reap. Our Vedic principles, of course, have always said, yad bhavam tad bhavati, yad bhavam tad bhavati, ya mati sagati. Adi Shankaracharya from our great Hindu mystic has said that whatever a person's mind dwells on intently and with firm resolve, that's exactly what he becomes. Whatever a person's mind dwells on intensely and with firm resolve, that's exactly what he becomes. Coming to the most recent spiritual masters, grandmasters, some of the channels, when you talk about Seth, the grandmaster Seth, who channeled through Jane Roberts, very squarely, the entire teaching is saying that your thoughts and feelings create your outer reality all the time. And your beliefs are always coloring your thoughts and feelings. That's just, that's safe. It's one of the greatest works that in the 19th century that we received from a channel material. And then the Abraham channel by Easter Hicks and Jerry Hicks that she's talking about anything that you give your attention to will become your truth. This is the law of attraction. Your life and everyone else's life is but a reflection of the predominance of your thoughts. There is no exception to this. That's the law of attraction by Esther Hicks. In a book, Ask and It Shall Be Given, she's talking about this all the time. And dear friends, Ramtha, one of the great, again, channel master through JJ Knight, is saying that your thoughts create the experience of your life. Everything we experience in life is merely shared by your thoughts. Your pineal gland is the seal that receives the signal as emotion into the body. And then it in turn sends a strong expectancy into your auric light field to make it manifest into your reality. So Ramtha, a great channel master, has always said your thoughts create the experience of a life. Even more recently, Van Dyer, he said, you see it when you believe it. So when you believe first, that means when you have a strong thought and feeling about something, then you can see it. That means you can physically manifest it. And then Bruce Lipton, the bioscientist who wrote this book, Biology of Belief, and few others, they said, your thoughts shape your reality. Your thoughts shape your reality. He even went to the point and said through epigenetics research that the genes, the human genes for the most part are reprogrammable. So they're not, there is nothing called hereditary. Everything can be reprogrammed through your thoughts. That's Bruce Lipton. And then to square it all, one of the greatest scientists of neuroscience and quantum physics and this whole mind or matter, Dr. Joe Dispenza says, your personality creates your personal reality. Your personality is made up of how you act, how you think and how you feel. And your personal reality of your life experience are merely shaped by your personality. So dear friends, thoughts create things. And then of course, no discussion is complete with the recent book by Dawson Church, The Mind to Matter, which is once again squarely saying that our thoughts are always shaping our outer experiences. Quantum physics, he's now validating this model perfectly. Quantum physics, during the last hundred years of research is concluded three pain things. 
one that everything is out there is energy. Everything out there is energy. It is a single big large energy field. And then two, it is saying that we are less matter, more energy. Individually in a body, we are less matter, more energy, everything is energy. And then two, it is saying that that energy has got infinite possibilities and opportunities and potentials. And third is that our observation collapses this possibility. Our observation is nothing but thoughts and feelings. He is collapsing our norm, bringing those possibilities into physicality from energy to matter. Our spiritual science have always said this, that we're not the body, we are the soul. That we have that infinite potential inside us and that our thoughts create that reality. That had bound that bhavati. So these three things are perfectly now validated through the research in quantum physics. You know, many a times when we think of somebody, suddenly that person calls us. This is because our thoughts send the signal to the person and when they're in the very highly receptive mode, so they have taken that and then they also simultaneously call. Dawson Church in his book is talking about this beautiful story that he was on this beach and in, on, in Hawaiian islands. And so he was gone, he was gone for snorkeling so he had moved from his apartment to the beach. And so in the beach where he had his keys of the apartment and then the keys for the car. So both of them puts them together to a bunch. And then he finishes snorkeling and then he comes out and then he walks up to the car and then tries to find the keys from the pocket. And he says, oh, the keys are not there. But the Dawson church Recognize that, oh, he lost the keys. So now he's locked out of the car. He locked out of the apartments. He cannot go. So now he started searching on the beach. Very quickly he realizes that they're not in the beach because not a crowded beach. So he realizes, he traced back all the steps where he'd walked, but then he realizes they're not in the beach. And he was very sure that they're not in the beach and they fell in the water, in the sea. So snorkeling that he was doing in that area, which is about 30 to 40 feet deep under the sea. There are a lot of reefs, a lot of corals. And so these keys now have fallen down. Perhaps somewhere they've gotten inside, somewhere into those reefs and corals. And the area that he was snorkeling was about 100 to about 150 meters. So now think of this, about 150 meters of area, about 30 feet deep into the seawater, underwater. And in that too, there in the corals, what are the chance of finding a set of keys? But he knows about this consciousness that our thoughts can create our experiences and events. So he is, he started thinking, he started imagining, he started visualizing that he's finding the keys. Then the keys are there going to be in his hand. He's finding the keys and he imagined. And then he started going and searching in the water. So he would go down and search and then he didn't find. And then just when he's losing hope, he suddenly recollects himself that yes, no, it's depending on how I think is what I find. And so he starts again imagining. And then he tries to do, so go down again into the water and then tries to find and he tries it for a few hours. It's getting dark for the day. So he comes back to the show. I recognize that it's very slim chances, but then however, he's not lost his hope. And then he's still dreaming and imagining that somewhere, somehow he's going to find the keys. And just when he comes out of water onto the shore, somewhere a little away, he sees a family, a, fa a father and two children. He sees a family that far. And then he somewhere instinctively feels so first they look up to that side and then instantly feel that he has to go walk up to them and ask them in case they have the keys. So he, without even thinking anything further, he just walks to them and says, you know what, I lost keys and did you find them? And one of the two boys, the younger one, 
takes the keys instead of keys and hands over to Dawson Church and says, here they are. He was stunned, but he understands that consciousness, their thoughts are always finding the target. The chances of in that entire sea of 150 meter long for 20, 30 feet deep down water with reefs, the chances that this family walking in and that boys also getting into the water and the keys getting lost and about the same time the boy finding them and then connecting them. And then when Dawson comes out of the water and then in the, in the end and then tries to just looking up accidentally to the other side and then feeling strongly that okay, I should still go and ask them. And then when they ask and the boy giving it's all happening in a short span of time. We may call it mere coincidence, but this is how thoughts are getting created into reality. When you believe strongly, things get created. It's called also, you are the placebo. It's called Dr. Joe Dispenza has written a book called You Are the Placebo. This placebo is talking that what you believe is what is always happening. <clears throat> You know, the people who walk on this fire, when they go into that, when they're about to walk on the fire, so they make a strong resolve in their mind that it is not going to do anything to them. It is something as normal as walking on sand. So they go into the fire with that heightened emotional vibration so that when they walk through it, nothing happens to their feet. Nothing seems to happen to their feet. So placebo is a pill, is a pseudo pill, pseudo tablet. Every medical company, when it wants to bring out a medical tablet, it has to apply this placebo effect. That you give a pseudo, a fake pill, telling patients, a group of patients and saying, you are receiving this medication, which is going to help you heal that condition. And then some people get the real pill where the actual chemical is there. The idea of this is that the, the real pill must work at least to the extent that the placebo pill, the fake pill worked on the patients. Because patients who were being told that it is a real pill, but they're given a fake pill, they still are always healing. A significant percent of them are always healing because they believe it is that medication which is gonna heal their condition. So what we believe is what is always healing us, but not necessarily the underlying chemical. A group of senior citizens have been taken. This is a research done by Harvard University. So they have been taken to a resort and the resort was decorated as 20 years earlier in time when the senior citizens have been taken to this resort. That resort has been made up as if to look it was 20 years older in time. So the senior citizens when the aged between 40 to 60 years when they walked into the resort, that resort started evoking the memories that they were when they were 20 years younger. So the resort, the dressing style, the food style, the TV, the furniture, the look and feel, everything, the environment has been changed to appear as if it is 20 years, the time frame is 20 years ago. So the people who walked in there, the senior citizens, they've been divided into two groups. One group has been told to just simply enjoy their time for one week in that resort. So they would watch the shows, which are 20 years older, TV shows. They would listen to the same songs of 20 years older. They were the food habits, the food style, the food dishes that are available in the resort are all 20 years older, that type, the dressing style. So they start living as if now they're 20 years younger. And so the other group has been told, you think you're 20 years younger, while the environment is still 20 years ago, depicting their younger days. So one group has been told to just live one week, another group has been told to live thinking that you are younger by 20 years. And then guess what, dear friends? At the end of that one week, 44% from the first group who was just simply living there became younger. 
where the second group where they also thought they're actually younger by 20 years, 63% of them became younger. What does it mean to become younger? It means now they grew height. You know, when people are aging up because if you believe that age is catching on the body, so they start having hunchback, they start drooping down. But here they became younger, 20 years younger. So their, their, their back became straight, the body became straight. So their height is longer now. They started playing, they started running, they started playing tennis, they started eating more, they started dancing more. When you is catching, when we are aging, so many people think that they cannot dance, they should not dance. And they think their body cannot take too much food. So they consume less, but here they became younger. They started taking more. Just by believing I'm 20 years younger and then having an environment that supports it because our environment is constantly triggering thoughts, which is pulling out our past memories. And so here, this group, who thought that they're 20 years younger in environment, so they became younger, dear friends. So our thoughts are shake up, shaping up. So the same group within a week started eating more, playing more. And so when they left the resort, they started continuing to live their life as if they're 20 years younger. So our thoughts that we have in our body. So for seven days, if you change the environment and if you change your thought, then there is a definite outcome that is seen. So thoughts and feelings create reality. So let us understand this a little bit more scientifically through quantum physics and how is this model. Let me show you a slide. So these are the three energy science principles. We are less matter, more energy. We are unlimited potential and possibilities. And we create a reality through our thoughts and feelings. Quantum physics and neuroscience is combining with validating this model. So let's look at it a little more deeply. The quantum field of possibilities. Deep inside, we are made up of subatomic particles. You know, our body has organs. Our organs have cells. Our cells are made up of atoms, molecules, and the molecules are made up of atoms, right? So, so you have hands, organs, our skin, our liver. Inside that you have liver cells, skin cells, cells are there. And the cells have molecules. So what do they typically contain? Maybe water, H2 was a molecule. Sodium chloride, NaCl is a molecule. Various hormones and engines, they're all various molecules. So the molecules are there. And then the molecules contain what? Atoms like water, H2O, two hydrogen, one oxygen, right? A little bit of physics. So there's atoms, when you look at deep inside in the here in the picture on the left side, it's an atom. So what does an atom contain? An atom contains a central portion called nucleus. And then it's got rotating electrons in the orbit. So the nucleus contains proton and neutrons which is supposed to have mass and weight. And then the electrons that are orbiting, like in this case here, you see the electrons that are orbiting the central nucleus also have a little bit of mass. But when you look at the picture, we recognize that when you look into an atom, the atom is empty. We recognize that yes, the dots that are there, the electrons and the nucleus are, are containing a little bit of mass and everything else is emptiness. So when you look at it, we say, yes, a lot of that atom is empty. But what quantum physics found astonishingly is that 99.99% of our atom is empty. So what we think as matter, if atom is 99.99% empty, then the molecule is 99.99% empty. That means the cell is that much empty. That means the organ is empty and so the body is empty. So the point dear friends is that what they found is that deep inside we are all emptiness. Now what did they find in this emptiness? The emptiness is full of energy. That emptiness they found is full of energy. Just like in the picture right side, that emptiness is energy. That energy has got information and that information is influenced by thought. And this is traversing beyond speed of light. Speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. 
which means one can go around the earth six times in a second. So first they found that it's all empty. Our atoms inside are totally empty. You know, our atom is empty, whether it's our atom, whether it is a microphone, this laptop's atom, your body atom, they're all empty. And it's all energy, which is like waves. Waves means there's no boundary. They're constantly traversing. So they're energy waves that are traversing. And so your atom energy waves, my atom energy waves, the trees, the plants, the nature, everything out there in the entire universe are all energy waves that are traversing all along. So when they traverse, they obviously they collide, they meet each other, they get entangled. It's called this full energy field. It's called quantum energy field. The second thing they found is that the electrons or the neutrons that we think are there as a particle, but actually they also exist as waves. They exist same as energy. You know, body per second, this, this quanta, these subatomic particles are vibrating up to eight tenths per second. They become matter, they become energy, matter, energy. Because it happens so fast, we don't even recognize. We've been from the childhood, have been conditioned to always look for matter. We've been, look, we've been always conditioned to look for boundaries. When we look at this phone and say, oh, this is phone, we recognize this as a phone because we observe the boundary immediately. We've been trained throughout our life, ever since we're born, to look at matter objects. And so the only thing we know is to always look at the boundaries and the conditions, solid matter. We now have been trained to look at defocus and then look into the emptiness around it. But when we start looking at emptiness around, we start looking at the energy fields of an individual called the etheric and aura. You know, when you read the book, you forever, you understand that you can actually read the energy fields around it only when we start looking, defocusing away from the hard matter. But we've been trained. But the point is scientifically it is proven inside we are emptiness and it's all energy. It's traversing beyond spirit of light and it is influenced by the field of thought. And whatever we think is the matter, like the electrons and neutrons, are also behaving as energy by default. But when do they become matter? When do they become particles? They're waves, they're particles, it's called wavical. But when do they become particle? When observed, the subatomic particle becomes matter. When observed. So they're an experimentation where they're sending a set of electrons through an electronic gun and then electrons are just going and then appearing on the screen, not as a straight line, but you know, they're oscillating and then showing up here and there and here and there because they're waves, they're not particle by default. But when they start looking and saying, how come I've been sending electrons, so there should be like particles, like a marble ball that should go straight, but why is it not happening? They start looking at it and saying, I'm sending this way, so it must go straight. So when they observed it, the electron went and appeared straight on the screen. So when observed, a subatomic particle became matter, but otherwise it's becoming as energy. So the quantum physics model is saying that it's all energy, including the electrons that we think are matter are actually all behaving as energy. And they're all interconnected because they're all as waves and so everything is interconnected with each other. So your atoms, my atoms, everybody's atoms, everything is energy is interconnected. And then he's saying that when somebody observes them, then they become particles. They actually show up in physicality. Their energy gets condensed and so they become physical. So they actually show up as physical matter. So as for this, an atom now can appear anywhere because it is traversing beyond speed of life as an energy. So it can show up anywhere are nowhere because it's not there by default it is energy not matter it's nowhere but it's everywhere everywhere whatever whatever we think and say okay i would like to see it here it shows there because observation collapse a possibility it's nowhere it's as an energy but it's everywhere wherever you think it can appear there so looking at this a little bit so the conclusion, foregone conclusion about this, dear friends, is that quantum field has unlimited potential possibilities. That means that 
this concept of aham brahmasmi tattvamasi sarvam kalvidam brahma that everything is energy is now quantum physics is saying everything is energy field now that energy field has is infinite possibilities how because there's so many of these electrons protons neutrons they all are as energy they all combined they all are interconnected with each other of yours everything of this universe as a big field and so whatever we observe so we can take an observe we can observe a set of sequence of electrons to collapse there as a possibility which is i think by an experience so what we are constantly creating in our life are experience of life an experience is nothing but a set of people places things that exist in an experience right now you are listening to me so this is an event this is an experience that we are going through this event or this experience comprises of you me and then whole set of people who are watching this my laptop pyramid valley here from where this is being beam telecasted a lot of people who thought about this whole program so you have a set of people a set of places like pyramid valley a set of things and with a definite start time and an end time this event started maybe about 15 minutes ago and it's going to go for another 15 minutes so it is an experience that we're going through and then this experience we are able to collapse here and actually go through because you thought about it i thought about it organized of pyramid valley thought about it and everybody came together and so then we could collapse this event so let's observe and how this observation causes possibility through this through this simple video let me try to share the audio along with it so that you can watch grateful acknowledgments to fred allen wolf for creating this beautiful video simplifying the concept of quantum physics observation collapse of possibility concept so let's let's listen to it And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles or little balls of matter act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, If we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. this is similar to the line the marbles make but when we add the second slit something different happens if the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave they cancel each other out so now there is an interference pattern on the back wall places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity the bright lines and where they cancel there is nothing so when we throw things that is matter through two slits we get this two bands of hits and with waves we get an interference pattern of many bands good so far now let's go quantum <laughs> an electron is a tiny tiny bit of matter like a tiny marble let's fire a stream through one slit it behaves just like the marble a single band so if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits we should get like the marbles two bands what an interference pattern we fired electrons tiny bits of matter through but we get a pattern like waves not like little marbles how how could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave it doesn't make sense but 
Physicists are clever. They thought, maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So, they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. So friends, as you can see from this experimentation, that when there's an observer expecting the electrons to behave in a specific way, so they became particles and so they went and formed the two bands. When they were not being observed, they behaved as waves and so they were collapsing, they're colliding with each other, canceling with each other, and then formed multiple bands of different intensities. So it's clearly our observation collapsed the possibility. So every physical event which is nothing but an experience in our life, is an appearance of a pattern of these subatomic particles. Subatomic particles, a pattern of them, of you, of me, of this person, of that person, everybody is attending this event. Your electrons of various places of a pattern of them, some are forming, some are part of this event more deeply, some are more lightly. So you have a pattern of all of these electrons combined all collapsed into physicality to have this physical experience of this event. So every event is an appearance of a pattern of these subatomic particles influenced by our observation. It's a collective observation, individual observation, a group observation, but it is an individual event, a group event that's always forming. So clearly our observation is creating part the, the, the energy, transforming the energy into matter. So an observation is nothing but our thoughts and feelings. So our thoughts and feelings are fundamentally creating our outer reality all the time. We have a meditator from UK. She has been losing her eyesight for the last 15 plus years. She's come almost to a point where she felt she is blind. And the doctors constantly been checking and saying, you've got this glaucoma issue. And so that is constantly deteriorating. And so your eyesight is absolutely going to be gone. It's not going to be, the eyesight cannot be restored. There's a conclusion. She came to us sometime last July. So roughly we're talking about now six to eight months. The entire time, our model of creation is that your thoughts and feelings create your reality. You can heal yourself by changing the way you think about your health, you think about your eyesight. 
And then constantly telling that be open because the doctors may tell you, but their condition, the friends may tell you, the conditions may show from a scientific perspective of the knowing of the understanding of the current science understanding that, okay, if the glaucoma is there, that it's going to be losing, you're going to lose a vision. But you got to be open because you don't know how consciousness works. Just like that keys of Dawson's search, receiving the keys from that boy, even though he'd been thinking that he'll probably find it somewhere. So we as a human mind can think limited, but then the constant message through our sessions has been that you be open. You don't know from which direction the consciousness has come and make things happen for you. And so with that hope, and this hope can be reinforced when you meditate, where we can slowly take out our fundamental past beliefs, redundant thoughts, and then past memories about this whole eyesight slowly losing and we stop doing things and all of that are the past memories, but meditation is slowly unseating each one of them. So with a regular practice of meditation and being more and more open about that, yes, something can happen, that my health can still improve, my health can improve, out of nowhere, suddenly, she's written in the last couple of weeks ago that her eyesight has dramatically improved. And then guess what? It's only a reason but suddenly an acupressure is found that there is some other, other than glaucoma condition, some other condition, which is some kind of swelling happening in another part of the eye. And so they started treating that and then so suddenly a vision improved dramatically. It was a conclusion before for over 15 years that this glaucoma, which is sort of getting deteriorating and so the side sight is going down, but with this person's hope and with this person's constant meditation with a positive thinking, that some way or the other, my eyesight is going to improve. Now suddenly started turning around, the eyesight is improving. It's our belief, it's our thought, dear friends. It's constantly sending the signal and upregulating our genes. Our cells that they discovered through epigenetics, that a cell's nucleus, when they removed the nucleus, the cell did not die. But the, when they damaged the membrane around it, the cell started dying pretty quickly. The cell membrane has receptors where it is constantly taking signal from the field around it. What is external to the cell is this whole field. In that field has this information, the thought, and then if the thoughts are coming and saying, you are rejuvenating yourself, you are repairing, you are regenerating, you're healing yourself if that's the information thought that is coming into the cell through the membrane and the cell is upregulating the genes and then producing a new protein to reconstruct a new part of the body. It's called epigenetics. But how is that signal coming through the mind? So the person, if a person can fundamentally think that I'm healing, my body has the capability to heal itself independent of what my past condition is. Because when I go back and look at that quantum field, everything is energy. Everything is a set of combination of all these energy patterns are there. Independent of what your past condition is, because quantum field says everything is infinite possibilities and they're all energy and you can collapse any possibility. Where is the question of past onto it? So you independent of the past, you can create a future just by holding on to that thing that you want to have as an experience. So the point, dear friends, is that we go after experiences, we don't go after things. An experience of what you wish to have, the people, the places, things, what kind of emotion, what kind of feeling that you go through, if you can visualize clearly, or if you can dream, that's why it's called visualization and dreaming. Successful leaders always knew it, that they can, they always dreamt of a future for themselves. Like Mahatma Gandhiji, freely, I mean, independent India, where all the Indian leaders are administering in the parliament building, and all the Indians are managing themselves, the rules, the policies, the systems, everything is done by Indians. So would imagine and dream about a free and independent India a rule by business. So he was dreaming and imagining about what is that thing that you want to have in your life as an experience. And so if we can do the same, if we can visualize and dream about positively, then we can absolutely hold it into our reality. 
So our thoughts and feelings are creating our reality. Now our thoughts and feelings are fundamentally colored by our beliefs that we hold. The beliefs that I'm not good enough. The belief that people are out to get me. The belief that you know, I have a poor background so I cannot really succeed. Believe that I don't have enough experience so I cannot really run a business. Believe that, okay, I have this hereditary condition, my body like the BP or sugar. And so my parents have it, my grandparents have it, so I'm going to have it, I have to live with it. So if we have these limiting beliefs, then that's exactly what we create. So then what do we need to do? We need to reprogram this, all these beliefs that have gone into a long-term memory, subconscious mind. Anything you repeat goes deep into your long-term memory and gets associated. There's a subconscious memory and subconscious pro program. So we have to reprogram, we have to deprogram, remove those, all those unwanted, unsupporting beliefs from our mind. Instead, so we have to reprogram ourselves with this expanded, expansive, new model of understanding because what you think and feel is what you create. So if you can deprogram our subconscious of this old limiting beliefs and then reprogram with new set of beliefs that support the thoughts create reality. That whatever we ask is always being created. A regret creates new regretful experience, so avoid regretting. That there is this quantum conscious consciousness in this field, which is a lot more intelligent than an individual self. So access the field for these unlimited possibilities. So when you have these larger understandings, which are more supportive, more expansive, more empowering, then you automatically start creating things. So this is where difference meditation comes into picture. Meditation fundamentally helps in many ways. Meditation helps to remove these unwanted subconscious programs from our subconscious mind. Meditation on the other side expands our conscious mind. So in order to change our thoughts and feelings, if you do a few things, one, we set a clear vision of our future. We set a clear set of experience that we wish to have in life, have goals. When we have goals, automatically our brain, the frontal portion of the conscious mind called the CEO of the brain is directing all the faculties of the brain to pull out information, memories, and, and anything that you know about it so that you can actually start applying more and more of the same thought to it. So we set a clear vision of the future, a goal for ourselves, and we start dreaming and visualizing and imagining about it. Dream an outcome as if it's happening to us. Because the more you can believe, the more you can manifest. So we got to dream as if that outcome is happening to us. A dream of a future with a lot of excitement, a lot of belief. Then how do we get there? When we meditate, we start aligning to ourselves and say, what is important to me? When you know what is important to you, then you are excited, you're passionate about it. You start can dream about it. You can visualize about it a lot more easily with a lot of feeling. And meditation is helping us increase our neural capacity, neural networks in our brain. So it helps us to learn new things. The more new things you learn, the thoughts create reality. Your ability to go and read the book, You Are the Placebo, Mind to Matter, A Biology of Belief. Or you go and then listen to the nature of personal reality by Seth. So meditation is helping us increase neural networks so that it helps us to enable us to learn more, a new model, a new model that supports our growth. So one side meditation helps to increase the neural capacity so that we can learn more. And another side, meditation increases our self-awareness. It's constantly keeping a check on our current thoughts, present moment thoughts and feelings, and then constantly reminding us to stay away from that. So it increases our self-awareness and as a result, we have an opportunity to stay away from all the limiting thoughts and beliefs on one side, and other side is increasing the neural capacity so that we can start learning more and more and increase various mind power so that what our goals, it increase the visualization capability. And so that then you can, you can visualize and dream about what you want more. And third thing meditation is doing is by removing all our thought, helping us merge into that quantum field because when we take out our thought, that means we take out our 
understanding of a body or environment and a past. So then what we are left is what we are deep inside that emptiness energy field. So meditation helps us to become that energy field, access the field. And when we become that energy field, our pineal gland gets activated. So we receive a lot of information and signal. Like Dawson Church, when he needed the keys, suddenly something came into him and said, go and look and then ask those people out there. So that is that intuitive signal, that is that information that you receive, a message inside we receive. And it works for us all the time because the consciousness, which is so intelligent, is always wanting to help us. So meditation is helping us connect into that field, connect into this consciousness where it is helping us sending a signal information constantly. When our mind becomes empty, we have a capability to receive more. So we receive, we pay close attention. So dear friends, to sum up, our thoughts and feelings are always creating our own reality. We have a set of lot of limiting beliefs which are limiting our potential constantly. This is not possible, that's not possible. I'm a woman, so I don't have, I have so many disadvantages in society. I am getting age, so my body becomes wrinkled with old age. So all these limiting beliefs are causing us to have a limiting experience in life. But the new quantum model of creation is saying that independent of your past, present reality, you can create a future present reality based on how you think and feel and you imagine and dream. And so to sum up, we need to shift our thought pattern from a negative disastrous thought patterns to a more positive and miraculous thinking. Because the quantum field is saying infinite possibilities, unlimited, anything that you wish you can have it. In fact, Richard Bach says, that you are given a thought only when you have the capability to experience it. You're given a thought, we're talking at a thought level. If comes, something comes to my mind and says, I'm gonna make a million dollar business, the thought is not given to you just like that because only because you are ready to experience it, if you wish to put your attention on it, you can experience it. So you're given a thought only when you have the capability to experience it. So as we are consciously evolving, we are also receiving these insightful thoughts that we can, if you want to go and implement. So the quantum field is saying unlimited potential. So there isn't a limit in what we want to have. Only when we can put our attention, we can believe in it, we can dream about it, then it can happen. And meditation is fundamentally helping us do that, dear friends. Meditation is fundamentally helping us increase our ability to put our attention on something that we want by increasing a neural capacity. It's helping us learn newer things. The more newer things you learn, the more older things you unseat. Use it or lose it is a neuroscience principle. Use it or lose it. So then when you don't use old beliefs, old thought patterns, they slowly die down. And while we meditate, it helps us to learn newer model of constructive, expansive beliefs and so that we can learn them and then we can totally program them. Then our subconscious is projecting for us all the time. It's projecting constantly those newer model of beliefs and thoughts so that that can go and then heal our body. That can go and then create things for us in our outer world, into our relationships, into our businesses, into our personal goals. So meditation is very simple. It's called breath mindfulness meditation. Patriji has been popularizing this simple meditation, breath mindfulness meditation, anapanasati. And then millions have taken to meditation. And when we understand meditation, and when we understand this fundamental spiritual sense principle, thoughts create reality. And these two, when you combine, we have a great combination of a new model of future creation. We apply these two together and then create a great future for ourselves. So I deeply thank all of you for joining this session. And I'm deeply grateful to Pyramid Valley International and Patriji, Brahmashi Patriji, the founder of Pyramid Spiritual Society's movement to empower me with this simple meditation technique and this fundamental spiritual sense knowledge that our thoughts create reality to shape a great future. So thank you so much for listening in. 
and then we look to meet you back again with similar sessions in future once again. Thank you and have a wonderful day.